Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. My name is Carly Jewell. I'm a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CCAST. For those of you who may be new to CCAST, CCAST supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, through webinars and workshops. We hope that these activities support the development of the communities, CCAST communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, aquatic restoration, and drought and climate adaptation. Today, we will be hearing from Ariel Legit and Elish Gornish. Both of our speakers will be talking about research in the Altar Valley of Southeastern Arizona. Ariel will be talking about their master's research using mesquite branch mulch and compost. And Elise will be discussing their research using rock mulch media lunas. A final reminder as always that these presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. So we'll go ahead and save questions for both presenters until the end, but feel free to be putting those in the chat. Um, we will kind of keep track of those questions for the panelists to answer after their presentations. So without further ado, I will wrap it up here, introduce the speakers, um, and I'll start with Ariel. So Ariel, Legi is a restoration ecologist and social scientist who studied the connection between soil health and plant health in a semi-arid rangeland at the University of Arizona. Ariel now works in the world of collaborative conservation and adaptation and climate adaptation, helping land managers connect to people, knowledge, and the resources they need to improve stewardship of ecosystems and natural resources they manage by coordinating CCAS's grassland restoration community of practice. Dr. Elise Gornish is a cooperative extension specialist in ecological restoration at the University of Arizona. Her research and outreach program largely focuses on identifying strategies for successful restoration in arid land systems and the integration of restoration approaches into weed management. And with that, I'll pass it to Ariel. Thanks, Carly. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. So good to be uh, on the other side of the, the, the CCAS table here as a presenter instead of facilitating the webinar. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, my master's research where I looked at the effects of branch mulch and compost uh, on soil health and how that feeds back to the plant community um, and the potential for that for ecological restoration uh, in grasslands. So the places that I studied and a lot of the techniques that I, that I studied um, are really based in the traditional ecological knowledge of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the Pascuayaki tribe and other indigenous peoples who've lived here for uh, many millennia and have a lot to, to share and to, to teach us about living in right relationship with these landscapes. And using uh, plant materials like mulch has uh, something uh, that, and, and also rock mulch is something that um, indigenous peoples in this region have been doing for millennia. And I think it's important to acknowledge that I'm just one sort of small step building on that uh, with my research. The place that I studied was in the Altar Valley. Um, you can see on the inset map here where that is. And you can see a beautiful picture, um, maybe a little bit grainy and pixelated at this scale, depending on what resolution your screen is at. Um, but it's a really beautiful valley. We were just there this morning. Um, and when there are good rains, it, it can look really uh, a lot like a grassland and a savanna here. But um, there's also the potential for it to look a lot more like this, um, where there's a lot more bare ground and a lot less herbaceous cover. In this picture, you see mostly cacti and perennial shrubs. And this is where my study location was, the, the, the specific location. So it's a really hot uh, sort of desert grassland on uh, in between two sort of ecotones. And as climate change uh, is making things hotter and more arid, we'll see how uh, plant communities continue to shift in these sort of intermediary zones and everywhere else. Um, there's biennial precipitation, both in the summer and the rain. The soils here are really sandy and rocky, and you can kind of see that in this picture, big cobbles on the, the surface, really low soil organic matter and not much soil structure. 
And here are some pictures of the treatments that I did. So like I said, uh, uh, with my title slide, I put down branch mulch. So these just roughly hewn mesquite branches. We just took a pair of loppers, uh, piled some, some branches of different sizes into a wheelbarrow and dropped them on the ground to make a layer about a foot thick. Um, it's difficult with the, the sort of, um, yeah, the morphology of mesquite branches. For those of us who are familiar with those, they can be kind of twisty and turvy, uh, but it's around a, a, one, a one foot depth layer of mesquite branches. And then we also, on the far left of your screen here, you can see um, two treatments that we used that looked a lot like this, where we put either one inch or two inches of compost with a layer of branches on top of that. Um, so there's the three centimeter, which is that one inch and the six centimeter. I'm gonna be referring to those in this presentation a little bit. And in the middle, you can see our controls. We had one control where we did nothing at all, and another one where we just broadcast some seed on top of some native grass seeds um, based on ecological site descriptions. And we did seed the, the mulch, the branch mulch, so the far right and the far left, the branch mulch and both compost experiments, where we put the seed on top of the compost, but underneath the branch mulch. The Questions that we were asking again, just to sort of ground in those are what those the effect of these amendments would have on the plant community and trying to understand what is causing those effects in the soil. So here you can see a number of the things that I, that I investigated, those soil uh, health metrics. And I'll, I'll get into those a little bit more, the, the details as we move along, but just know that, that we did a lot of really good science here. Uh, and I'm just gonna focus on the most pertinent ones. So I'm gonna start with the effects on the plant community. And what you can see here on the right is sort of a summary of these three treatments and how they performed in comparison to those controls that I mentioned before. And what I want you to take away here, this is kind of the takeaway message of my research really, um, is that mulch when used alone really does increase the, the cover and abundance of plants compared to controls. When you add a thin layer of compost, so that one inch or three centimeter layer underneath the mulch, it has some positive effects, but it's not um, statistically distinguishable from the control treatments. Whereas six centimeters of compost, that really thick layer, actually reduced the abundance of plants compared to doing nothing at all. So this is sort of what it looks like when you're out there. Um, the picture on the left is before the first monsoon. So this a uh, research project was a two-year research project. We had two rainy seasons and we measured plant uh, metrics kind of throughout and then we measure, measured soil uh, metrics, those things I had on the first slide um, at two points after each rainy season, uh, monsoon rainy season. So on the left here, these are the controls before either rainy season and on the right, it's the same plot after two rainy seasons. And although the, the color is a little bit different, um, you can see that not much happened, but there was very little herbaceous growth, only the perennial shrubs that were already there uh, kind of greened up in, in the summer. And you can see that really clearly. This is, these are figures from a, a paper that I published about some of this research um, in restoration ecology. And uh, both the controls, so the control and the seeded here, um, don't, didn't really do much and they look really similar to each other. So uh, these graphs I'm gonna come back to again, so I'll orient to us to them a little bit. On the left, we have cover uh, after the first rainy season in 2018 and after the second in 2019. And on the right, we have abundance of plants. So how many individuals, uh, same thing. On, on, the, on the left, it's 2018 after the first rainy season, on the right, 2019. What really stands out on these graphs, however, is that, that really distinct peak uh, in the mulch treatments. So the mulch was six, had significantly um, increased cover and abundance of plants uh, in both years. And this is what that looked like. So once again, these are these sort of before and after pictures. Uh, and all we did here was throw some mesquite branches on the ground, um, scattered some native grass seeds. And we saw that we managed to, to really, yeah, increase the, the cover and abundance of plants. There was a big forb response, and especially after the winter, we saw um, green carpet weed here that you see a picture of really take over. Um, and that was like one of the most, I think anecdotally, but really, well, it's also in the data, but uh, one of the most impressive uh, results was just seeing like almost a 100% ground cover at some points when these uh, annual forbs would come up in the mulch compared to the, the, the controls. And it was, yeah, it was really quite stark. Um, in terms of plant cover and abundance, when we added one 
a, a small layer of compost at three centimeter, we didn't see a statistically significant difference here. So if you can see my mouse here, you can see that these error bars are, are kind of overlapping with the controls. You don't see much higher, uh, a significantly, a, a statistically significant increase in plant variables. But when you look at the picture, you can see that the plants that did establish got pretty large. So here on the left, we see um, one of the plots that had mulch and a three centimeter layer of compost underneath it. And comparing that to the right where there's mulch alone. Um, and once again, it's a little bit, sometimes a little bit tricky to tell from pictures, but those few bunch grasses that did establish in the compost plots were much larger uh, than the ones on uh, in the mulch alone. So that compost did benefit the plants, but it's sort of, um, smothered emergence of plants from the soil seed bank. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the six centimeter compost. So having that really thick layer, we saw almost no plant emergence and the plants that we seeded didn't seem to establish very well. So you can see that here in these before and after pictures, um, <laughs> they look almost the same. I have a, a little red circle around the one lonely grass plant that grew in this plot after, after two years. Um, but yeah, um, kind of a, a do not recommend situation here. And you can see that really clearly in these graphs again, that uh, it's much lower than the controls and really any other treatment here when you add six centimeters of compost. Great, I'm gonna try to run through what we think is happening here. So why does mulch alone increase the grass abundance uh, and compost doesn't really seem to help that much? What's going on? So like I said before, we studied the microclimate, we had several soil variables for the soil microclimate, so moisture temperature, the soil structure, uh, nutrients, but most significantly soil nitrogen um, and the soil organic matter. And we, we kind of went through these one at a time to see what's happening. The aggregate stability, so the, the structure of the soil didn't change over the two years that we measured it. So it's highly unlikely that that's what's leading to these differences. And although compost did increase soil nitrogen and organic matter, mulch didn't. There was no significant increase with mulch alone. Um, and yet mulch had a really positive impact on that plant community. So that's probably not the, the leading factor here. You know, Although it did help some of those plants that established get larger, um, as you can see in this left-hand side picture here, it's not really what helped the mulch alone block. And what that leaves us with is the microclimate. And those differences were really stark here. And you can see some takeaway messages here. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk us through these through some uh, fairly complicated graphs. So bear with me here. Um, <laughs> this is what the, the, the climate was like at this, at this field site over the two years that we measured it. So you see 2018 on the left, 2019. And all I want you to pay attention here to here is these uh, blue peaks above the red line. So what that's indicating is that it's a, a wetter time of year. And when the blue hash is underneath the red line, it's a drier point of the year. So this is what that climate looks like. And um, when we look at the soil moisture graph, we can really see that there was a wetter summer in 2018 compared to a drier summer in 2019. You see similar differences in the early and late winter, but what I'm gonna focus on here to, to show these effects of what mulch alone is doing and why we think it's helping plant emergence is by focusing on the wet summer uh, of 2018 and the dry summer of 2019 side by side. So this is just zooming in on that wet summer, or on the, yeah, the wet summer. And what I want you to see here is this blue line, the mulch, is much higher. So every time it rains, there's a peak in soil moisture that we're seeing here on the, the vertical axis here. And we can see that when it rains, the mulch plots are seeing a lot more moisture in the soil than the plots with compost. And that happens for the first, the second, uh, not quite the third, but the fourth here. So we can see a pattern of you know mulch really being having more, allowing more moisture into the soil than that compost until later on in the season. Um, on the other hand, the compost plots like this this dark uh, black line or the dotted line here is allowing that moisture to stay in longer. So you can see that this dry out curve is gentler than in the mulch alone. And you can see that again in the in the dry summer. So you can see that consistently across the board, the mulch plots are allowing more soil moisture into the ground than the, the, the plots with compost, especially the six centimeter compost. And I, I want you to look at these little red circles here to see that sometimes when it rains, you see a, a, a 
a response soil moisture rain making it into the soil and wetting the soil in the mulch plots, but not at all in those compost plots. So those compost plots are sometimes preventing soil moisture from making it into the uh, into the ground. So when it rains, the soil moisture isn't getting in there, staying in the compost, evaporating before it makes it into the soil. Um, especially when there's these smaller rain events or during uh, during the, the the hotter season. And that's important because in these semi-arid landscapes, uh, most of the precipitation events are, are these short, small uh, rain events, you know, in terms of how many there are. We also have these larger monsoon storms that could be, uh, you know, a half inch or an inch or, or more. But a lot of the, in terms of frequency, a lot of the rain events that we happen are, are smaller. And those are really ecologically significant, especially for the response of the Ford community and annuals that we really saw uh, take off and contribute greatly to the plant cover in the mulch alone plots. Um, yeah, this is kind of a, a summary again of what I just explained through those complicated graphs, <laughs> which is that mulch seems to allow, mulch alone seems to allow an optimum balance between that infiltration into the soil and the reduction of evapor evaporation. So it reduced the soil temperatures, increased the soil moisture, whereas compost was um, was intercepting some of that rainfall and allowing it to evaporate before it made it into the soil, um, especially after it dried out. The compost had dried out for an extended period of time and could become hydrophobic. Um, yeah, so this is just that as another summary slide of you know mulch really good for the plant community. Uh, a thin layer of compost could be good. I'd probably go even thinner than what we did to try to reduce the, the smothering effect of compost. And a lot of compost didn't seem to do anything good for us. And all of these results, I think when we're thinking about um, expanding them to different areas, uh, we have to remember that the, the soil texture is important to remember. So we have this sandy, gravelly soil. Um, the experiment was only two years, so it's a short duration. It's possible that uh, further down the line, these uh, effects would change as things break down, as the mulch or the compost degrades a little bit. And that in extreme uh, seasons, so when there's a, a really harsh drought or a lot of rain, it might, uh, it might change those results. And I think that in terms of implications, um, these sort of methods of using branch mulch alone, especially, are scalable. We can see a picture of a media luna with branch mulch in the Altar Valley here um, that, I, that I didn't study for my project. And on the bottom, we can see a really large scale experiment uh, in Big Bend National Park, grasslands, not badlands, that we'll hear about uh, in the new year in February, where they scaled this to a sort of landscape. Uh, scale using these big bands of branch mulch to restore uh, the plant community. So this is a scalable um, technique, but you can also use it at a smaller scale to create restoration islands um, that have the potential to benefit pollinators and also pronghorn and other animals like quail that um, use forbs to, to, to feed on because we saw a really big forb response uh, from branch mulch branch alone. Also to cut the mesquite branches when there are no seed pods on them as we did. I think that if there are uh, ripe pods or <laughs> ready pods on them, we just end up spreading mesquite, um, which is not necessarily what we're intending to do in most cases. And we didn't see a large increase in invasive species, which was really great. Um, we were happy to see that. We only saw a couple uh, individual grass plants um, throughout the two years of our, of our experiment, mostly native species. Um, and, and that's it. This is my acknowledgments. A lot of people helped. Um, Elise was on my committee, who you'll hear from next, and uh, jo Dr. Joey Blankenship, Craig Rasmussen, Sam Rathke from the University of Arizona, the, Dr. Kristen Ball, who was a postdoc, who was really helpful, especially in the publication process. Walter Lane, who was the land manager uh, at the Santa Margarita Ranch, where my experiment was happening, and the Alta Valley Cultivation Alliance that are, that are great, as always. Um, so thank you. Keep putting those questions in the chat. Um, happy to discuss this more. Um, yeah, during the Q and A. Amazing. Thank you, Ariel. Um, we got a couple of questions in the chat here that I went ahead and I have noted down. So we'll circle back to those after our presentation from Elise. And so I'll hand it over to Elise to take it away for us. Thanks. Let's um, do this whole share screen thing. Uh, and here we go. You all see the my screen? 
Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So howdy, everybody. Good morning. Thanks, Ariel. You make a really hard presentation to follow because that was awesome. Uh, my name is on here as well as Trace Martin, who's the postdoc who did, um, I would say, most of the work on this project. Um, and she's amazing. So all the stuff you like about what I'm about to say, she did. And if you don't like anything, I probably um, did it. But I'm going to um, switch a little bit and talk about rocks. Uh, but we're going to stay in the same place. We're staying in the Altar Valley. Um, and most of this work is motivated by the fact that doing restoration or really vegetation management in arid systems is incredibly <laughs> difficult. Um, in this sort of dated paper, uh, Stuart Hardegree and colleagues found that there was less than 5% success in seeding efforts in the um, arid Western US, which is pretty dismal. A, a newer paper from 2020 ups that to about 7%, but it's still pretty bad. Um, so why is this? Well, there's lots of reasons, but, but um, lots and lots of demographic papers have found that actually um, one of the main barriers to ecological restoration and, and um, vegetation management in arid systems is the seed loss due to desiccation stress, wind, and seed eating animals. Okay, so if we want to enhance outcomes for ecological restoration and veg management in arid systems, we have to directly address this bottleneck to success, which is seed loss due to desiccation stress, wind, and seed eating animals. How do we do that with rocks or kind of with rocks? Come on the rock parade with me, okay? Um, rock mulch, or specifically media lunas, might be a really effective way um, to deal with seed loss due to desiccation stress, wind, and seed eating animals. Let me tell you why. So media lunas are essentially um, half moon shaped structures of rocks that you put out on flat landscapes. And usually these can be small, they can be three meters across, they can be really big, they can be 15 meters across or more. And this is the way they work, okay? This is a picture that shows the way they work. So if you have these media lunas on uh, flat landscapes in the arid Southwest that um, flood, what happens is that as waters, as monsoon rains come and flooding occurs, flood um, waters move across flat landscapes um, in sheet flow movements, so which is a lot of water that kind of moves really slowly across the landscape. And as the water is moving through the landscape, because it's a force, it's picking up organic material, it's picking up soil, it's picking up seed, it's picking up small rocks, all kinds of delicious things. So all that stuff is moving in the water. Now, what these media rock lunas do is that they're usually just about one or two rock levels above the ground, okay? So they're on the flat ground, um, and maybe they're, I don't know, a quarter meter or quarter, excuse me, a quarter foot tall. But because they're um, something that the water actually hits, the water hits these things in the catchment area, which is shown, and the force of the water is reduced. When the force of the water is reduced, what happens is all that seed, all that organic material, all those sticks, all that delicious stuff gets dropped in the catchment area of the media luna and the water flows over the media luna. And as the water eventually recedes, you have this really nice bed for uh, germination in this catchment area of the media lunas. You have all this organic material, um, the organic material is really good for growing plants, but it's also good, as Ariel noted, for holding on to moisture, and you have all these seeds. Um, and you can actually see this organic material in this picture. So this is a picture from Google Earth on media lunas I did not install, but they're in the same region. And you can see the half moon shapes. But if we get a little closer, the arrows are pointing out these darker colors in the catchment area of the media lunas. And those darker colors, that's actually the reflection of the organic material. Okay, so you have this delicious little seed bed that you didn't even have to do anything for except for putting the rocks out. And not only do you have this area where now you have more organic material for growing plants, which is good, and you have more seeds, which was dropped by the water, and you have this organic material that holds onto the moisture. Um, but you also have these rocks that further shade the soil surface. So when you have shading in the soil surface, you have a reduction in moisture loss at the soil surface, and you have a slight reduction in temperatures at the soil surface. So these are further factors that are enhancing germination of your seeds. Um, and the rock lunas themselves can slightly reduce erosion. So as the water, again, these things are pretty localized. They can be like maybe, I don't know, a meter across, but 
10 meters long or, or five meters long. And so you don't have sort of this large scale um, protection of the system as Ariel was noting at the end of his talk, but um, right when the water sort of hits media lunas and usually you place several of them um, sort of together in a landscape, you have a slight reduction in the force of the water. So you have a slight reduction in the erosion that occurs. And so this is showing um, sort of some of the plants that are growing as a result of the, um, the changing of the soil uh, due to the shading of the soil surface and the dropping of the organic material in the seeds. But on the other side, you can see all that erosion that's happening that was happening through flood events. But right on the other side of the rocks, you see there's plants. So as the water actually moves over the rocks, you have a slight reduction in the force. There's a slight reduction in the erosion and then the water starts moving in and there's more erosion. Um, this is not a picture of Media Luna, but this I also wanna show uh, a representation of how medialinas also then um, reduce uh, seed and seedling loss due to uh, granivores and herbivores. So often an issue is when you're doing restoration, if you're seeding out a whole bunch of native plants is that the plants start growing. And then in this sort of more drier barren landscape, you have this delicious um, sort of uh, uh, buffet of plants growing around. And so because a lot of seeds get deposited right at the edge of the rocks or even within the rocks, when plants are growing, they're slightly protected from granivory, so seed loss by seeding animals, or from herbivory uh, by the rocks. It's actually physically harder to get your face in there to eat the seeds and the plants. Um, and they, uh, they function very similar to um, uh, mulch of trees, which I'm not going to go into because Ariel just did a really nice um, description of that. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Media Luna is in the sense they have been used for a very, very long time, but there's very little bit of formal research um, conducted on them. So in the absence of some of this formal research, it's really hard to make science-based recommendations to managers, right? And so here's just an example of some, these aren't, these are rock walls, they're not media rock lunas, but they function very similarly. This is in um, Santa Rita experimental ranges are about 50 years old. You could see that the gray is actually the um, plant material that's growing at the rock lunas. And this is a terribly scanned photo, I think from my like phone or something, but someone gave me this map of rock lunas that are near the Catalina State Park boundary that these are over 4,000 years old, okay? So this is a very, very ancient technique that clearly um, has been working because it's been around for at least 4,000 years. Um, but again, there isn't much um, sort of formal research into some design and application strategies, and thus it's hard to make science-based recommendations. So I'm going to talk about a study where we looked at the short-term, very short-term, within a year impacts of media luna installation. We're going to be looking at the soil microbial community, and soil microbial communities are usually fairly good indicators of soil health and the plant community. So we deployed an experiment out in Altar Valley, um, not at the same ranch that Ariel was talking about, but very, very close ranch. And our treatments were um, small rocks, so this is two to five centimeters. And this is kind of what it looked like. So there was this almost 100% cover of the soil surface, which is very important. Um, small rocks are good because they're much easier to move around. Usually they're cheaper. Um, and then larger rocks are eight to 12 centimeters. So these are, this is not a picture from the site as you could probably tell, but um, larger rocks are more expensive to move um, and more expensive to buy. But the thing with larger rocks is that when you put them down on the landscape, there's lots of interspaces um, for at the soil surface. And this becomes relevant later. Um, we seeded all of our media lunas um, and then we seeded out some areas in which we did not have any rocks. So it was just seed. Um, and then of course we had some control plots, which we had no rocks and no seed. So this is a schematic of our sampling design. So we collected plant cover and seedling data um, several places across the media luna, and then we collected soil chemistry and microbial community data um, just in the center of luna in a transect. And we did this twice. So we collected data in fall. So we deployed the lunas in 2020, which anyone on here probably remembers. There was like not a drop of rain. So fall, we collected data four months after deployment where there was absolutely no rain. And then we collected um, data, the same plant cover and seedling and soil chemistry data nine months after deployment um, of the lunas when there was about four inches of winter rain, okay? So what do we find? Well, in the fall, after absolutely no rain, um, this is showing total percentage of um, vegetation cover on the y-axis and across the x-axis, I have those different treatments. So the control where we had no rocks, no, no seeds, seed only, small rock and large rock lunas. And then there's three bars and you're gonna be seeing a lot of things that look like this, which is why I'm explaining it. 
is three bars of the different locations. So the catchment, that's the first place, I think it's the concave, con convex. I always mess those up, but like where the water hits and the, the inside of the moon. Um, so the catchment right in the middle of the uh, Luna and then right on the outside. And we found that plant cover after absolutely no rain was unaffected by the Lunas. What a surprise, you have no rain, there's, there's no plants, okay? Um, but we did find that of the existing plants that were there, in general, there was lower plant cover in the middle of the Luna where you're gonna have more of that sort of continuous rock cover. Not that interesting, right? Okay, so media Lunas don't really do much for you if there's no rain. So in the winter, after four inches of rain, what do we find? So this is the ugliest graph I've ever made in my life, but it serves a purpose. So let me let me um, tell you how this graph works. Okay, so the axis, the, the locations across the bottom, so across the x-axis, if there is a purple square associated with it, it means that there's more plants in that location across the x than across the y. So for example, um, the, for the large uh, rocks, the large rock lunas, both in the catchment, the middle area, and in the drainage, there was three times more seedlings. You see a lot more of those purple squares than in any of the other treatments, okay? So what this ugly graph is telling you here is that large rock lunas were three times more effective at growing plants when there's actually some rain than any of the other treatments, than small rock lunas, than just seeding, or than doing nothing at all. But small rock lunas weren't useless. Um, ignoring the large rock lunas, if you just use small rock lunas, which had a much more sort of complete coverage of the soil surface, you're gonna get two times more seedlings than if you do nothing for control or if you just do seeding. Um, this is showing uh, litter cover, which can be really important um, for soil health. So litter cover was higher in the catchment areas of big rock lunas, but we didn't find that for small rock lunas. We also found that soil moisture was higher in the middle of the lunas, which shouldn't be terribly surprising because that's essentially where the rocks are covering and shading the soil surface. We didn't see much um, change in the soil moisture in the catchment area where we thought maybe there'd be some shading of the rocks. And we didn't find after nine months any effects of lunas on soil carbon or nitrogen. We measure this because that's kind of what you're supposed to do, but usually you don't see any effect of carbon from anything you do for at least five years. Nitrogen, you might see something, but at least after nine months and a little bit of water, we don't see any effect of lunas on nitrogen and certainly not on carbon. Um, these are um, community ordination plots of the bacteria, which is the um, leftmost plots and the fungi, which are the rightmost plots. So if you just look at the two top plots, essentially what happens is we go out there and we take a little bit of soil and then we sequence that soil and we get millions of strands of DNA and we get thousands, if not millions of sequences of the different things that are in the soil. So how do you take all of that data and graph it somehow? Well, you can concatenate all of that data down into two numbers, an X and a Y. So each dot on that graph is one place where we took soil. Okay, and the different colors are just telling you where in the lunas they are. And all you need to get from this is that any two points on that graph that are closer together means that the communities are more similar. Any two points that are farther apart means the communities are more are farther apart. So if the lunas were having any effect on the bacterial communities or on the fungal communities, what you would expect is all of the um, small rock lunas, which are squares, to cluster together, and all of the large rock lunas, which are pluses, to cluster together. And clearly, there's no clustering. So the large rock and small rock lunas had no effect on the bacterial or fungal diversity um, in the soil. So, so far, based on, for the most part, litter, soil nitrogen, soil carbon, and soil microbial communities, we don't see in the um, near term or short term any effect of our lunas uh, on soil health or these things that we're using as proxies for soil health. Okay, so can rock solve all of our problems? The answer is sorta. So on a very, very short time scale, we did see some differences that are very important for managers. So using rock lunas to create, using large rocks to create lunas appears to result in higher seedling number and this is just nine months and after a drought, okay? Just nine months after deployment and after a summer of absolutely no rain and a small amount of enhanced soil health in terms of litter, okay? And some soil moisture increase. We, these experiments are still going on. So we're, I think now on our, what year is this? To 2022. We're on our second year of data collection and we're going to be um, collecting this data so we can actually see what kind of long-term effects there are. Um, okay, 
that's my talk. I went through that really, really quickly. Sorry, but um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much. That was wonderful. We have a lot of really good comments and questions going on in the chat. Um, certainly encourage folks to keep plugging those in and maybe we'll start off with some of the questions. Um, the first one being for Ariel, which was from Laura. And the question was, what is the composition of the mulch that you used? Yeah, thanks for that question. So the, the branch mulch that we used was branches. That's it. We just chopped uh, whole mesquite branches. Very simple. Uh, the compost that we used as a mulch, which can be a little bit confusing, I know, circular logic, but we put the compost on top of the ground, so it's mulch, eh, whatever. Um, that compost was made, it was actually uh, local, locally sourced from tanks green stuff. Some folks from Tucson may know tanks. Um, it's mostly cow manure and uh, chipped wood, so organic cow dairy manure and chipped like landscaping wood from Tucson, large variety of different things. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And maybe I'll, I'll kind of try to go back and forth here. This question was for Elise from Gita and feel free. I'm gonna just read the questions, how they came in from the chat, but if anyone wants to unmute themselves after I do and provide a little more context or expand on what they asked, definitely feel free to uh, take the space to do that. But the question for Elise is, there seems to be a tendency these days for people and organizations involved in urban water harvesting to recommend using organic mulch instead of rocks and gravels. Exactly the opposite of the conclusions your research suggests as best practice for wildland restoration. Can you comment on this apparent divergence? Well, so one of the reasons why, hi Gita, by the way, one of the reasons why Lunas um, appear to work so well is that their function in tandem with the flooding that occurs. Um, and so you need a lot of flooding and a lot of sort of space around the Lunas so that all that organic material can be picked up in the seeds and all that stuff. And that can still operate in um, urban areas. There's still, a pl unfortunately, plenty of sort of like bare ground that organic material can be picked up, but I think less so. And so you could still use sort of rock mulch, certainly in, in water harvesting and people do all the time. Um, and you can pair it with seeding. Um, but I think you're gonna lose a little bit of the benefit when you don't have this like large amount of organic material being moved, captured by the, the lunas, and then that acts as sort of a seed bed. Again, you'll probably still, you probably still have that in ur urban water harvesting, but um, not to the extent. And from, from what I understand, um, there's in the literature anyway, there's a whole bunch of stuff about why you shouldn't use mulch, not mulch, why you shouldn't use compost in rangeland systems. Um, but there's still a big debate because some people are like, well, it enhances invasives. And then other people are like, but it enhances the soil um, microbial communities and blah, 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 blah. But in urban systems, I think people are a little um, less worried about sort of manipulating some of those things because it's usually smaller areas where you um, have more of a hand in um, being able to modify things that you don't like. So it's a super ver verbose answer, but th that's what I, that's what I think. Amazing. And, and just to follow up with that, Elise, um, you probably have seen this, but in the chat, there's some good information. Gita mentioned that there's some good research on ancient rock works and soil fertility on the Agua Fria National Monument. Cool. And then John talked about um, some of the most agricultural rock mulch features in the Tucson area and Agua Frita to date to the How Ha Come. Eh, hopefully, I'm oh, okay. right. Mm -hmm. um, of course, he did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so with that, I'll jump us back up to a question for Ariel that came in, which was what perennial grass species established in your mulch alone treatments one year after application? What further changes occurred between October 2019 and October 2022 in the various treatments? Cool. A two-parter. Love it. Um, <laughs> the first part of that question, what established a whole bunch of stuff? I don't have 
the list with me, um, but I'll put my email in there and you can send me. I did ID, ID everything I could to species when I was out there. So um, I can give you that data if you want. I can give you the sort of really nitty gritty nerdy details, um, but just sort of off of the cuff, we had some sand drop seed, we had some uh, cane beard grass, green sprangle top. Um, those were seeded species, unseeded species. We had a number of threons, purple threon being the most common, um, some spike grass, fluff grass. Sorry, I'm not using all the, the real names here. I'm just giving you the, the you know, uh, common names. So take, take it as you will. Um, and then a ton of different forbs uh, that I can't remember right now. Uh, but once again, I'll, I'll give you that in, in the data if you send me an email. I can, I can give you the, the nitty gritty. And then the part two was what happened after I uh, graduated, right? So after 2019, um, I, I stopped going to the Altar Valley and measuring this field site. <laughs> so what happened after 2019? Um, but I've been there uh, afterwards and can give you some observational uh, sort of uh, what I saw when I was there without measuring anything. Um, and that was after 2020 drought, I was there and I saw that there are still a lot more plants in the mulch alone uh, plots and in, in the mulch and three centimeter compost with like that little application. So um, yeah, I think that those changes persist. I think that if you can get those perennial glasses to, to establish that the small changes that the mulch and the compost have had on the microclimate can help even during those really dry years. Um, I wasn't there during the growing season, so I can't tell you if those perennial grasses persisted. They were senesced or dead when I was there. Um, but, you know, the, the mulch was still there. There was a little bit less of it, but that branch mulch is really hardy. So I, I would think that even if they're, are, they are slightly less than when we just put them down, that some of those mic microclimate modifying effects like the shade uh, and the infiltration would still be present um, even three, four, five years after, after um, application, as long as the, the branch mulch is still there. Yeah, potentially changing the trajectory of local ecohydrology, as, as some might say. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, let's go back to Elise here. This question is coming in from Jennifer. And it said, will you be able to go back and assess Media Luna associated soil health and fungi into the future? Yes, yes, we will. We're not sampling every year because we just don't have the, the grant money for that, but um, we're probably gonna do it at year five, year 10. Um, and depending on what interesting things we're now starting to work with metagenomics and so we can do really fancy things to figure out. Because if you figure out that there's change in bacterial composition or change in, um, fungal richness or things like that. Like, what does that mean in terms of soil health really? Well, you don't know, except if you use something like metagenomics, which can actually tell you something about the traits of the things we're finding in the soil. And those traits are usually related to certain ecosystem services and thus are much easier to connect to um, soil health. So uh, yes, but not every year. We're looking at this at probably year five and year 10. Got it. So this question, this next question, initially, um, Danielle posted and said, great work, Ariel, I'll get some positive feedback there. Um, but I'm going to open this up actually to both speakers. Uh, Danielle asked, I'm interested in learning more about the incorporation of IK slash TEK. Um, can you share any publications or information on that? So I'll open it up um, for both Rock and Branch Mulch, if there's any uh, publications or information that either of the presenters have, um, or really anybody from, from the larger participant group. Um, but I'll start with the presenters to see if they have any things that come to mind. Yeah, um, I think I'd be the first to say that I, I didn't do a very good job of that. Um, in my research, I didn't have any partners from the Dahona Odom Nation or any, anybody who has is a knowledge holder uh, be a part of this project, either in terms of their advisory capacity or um, in terms of being materially supporting the project in other ways or benefiting from this project in other ways. Um, and I point you to, to people, to indigenous scholars who are studying this, who are doing it really well. One person who's on the top of my mind is uh, Carletta Chief, who um, is in the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Arizona and has a lot of really great work 
pub published about um, working in tandem with Indigenous communities and other Indigenous researchers and supporting Indigenous ways of knowing and, and in integrating that into the research that, um, you know, uh, academics like myself tend, tend to do. So that's that's one place to start. And, and Danielle, I'm happy to continue this conversation later. And I've got a, a bunch of things, a bunch of publications in my uh, Mendeley uh, drive, a bunch of papers that I have left over that I'd be happy to share um, a lot of stuff later to, to continue this conversation. Yeah, one of the um, the things about TEK is that tech, mm, generally um, the information is not shared in the same way that um, scientists are used to accessing information. So often TEK is shared either by word of mouth or um, among friends and family members and researchers like Ariel and I are used to kind of going into Google Scholar and downloading like stodgy peer reviewed publications. And so um, I'm not sure uh, the, I'm not aware of any indigenous scholars that are working with rock mulch specifically, but there might be. Um, but I wonder where those, that information would be. I don't think it would be in tradition, for the most part, um, in traditional um, uh, peer reviewed publications. Great. I'm gonna, there's some other comments coming into the chat. I think Renee said that it would be great to hear from the local tribe on this approach and what they found. And then a follow up um, saying that the Hopi tribe does this kind of work and, and also curious who um, the POC from the tribe is. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, Renee, if, you, if I capture those comments or you have any follow up there. Looks like at least no, it's okay. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to know which BIA or tribal representative um, folks that worked on this project, um, who the POC is and um, that we can, I could reach out to and see how their perspective is. And um, usually that's um, something that I'm more interested in. Yeah, uh, Renee, the Tohono O'odham Nation has an entire environmental department that I'm sure would be, uh, actually, I'm not sure, might, might be willing to engage with with you on that on those questions. I, like I said, didn't do a great job of that. I didn't explicitly incorporate any tribal partners into the production of any of my research. Um, but there's also people at the, the University of Arizona, like Michael Kotutwa Johnson, who um, is, is Hopi and also works with um, Carletta Chief, who I was mentioning before. And, and Michael has a lot of knowledge about um, that he's sharing in more traditional uh, publications and is interested in, in promoting about Hopi farming techniques and things like that. That's again, not what I studied, but he might be able to point you to, to folks uh, who are part of the Hopi Nation and Department of Environment or, or people uh, on Hopi Nation who are using rock mulch or doing restoration work in different ways. I know there's a lot of people in, in many of the, the sovereign tribal nations across Arizona and, and the, the desert Southwest who are using these techniques. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't point you to, to specific people. No, in that's okay. I've, I've heard of both of them. Um, I think from that tribe, there might be a person named Karen and if if people are interested in tribes, I would look to the P, their other counterpart, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And for the, your region, if it's uh, something you're still working with in the southern um, part of Arizona, that would be the western region. Their office would be located in Phoenix. But if you're talking about um, Hopi tribe, they would still be part of western region because western region has like about 13 tribes. But for us, um, we work with Navajo Nation, so it's ours is Navajo region. And for Navajo Nation, they only have one region from BIA. So if people want to reach out on the traditional TEK -E -E usage, um, you are probably best to contact a BIA representative, like a range um, man management specialist or um, there's one at each agency or each region, and I think there's like 12 regions across Indian country, meaning across the United States, and 
that they can direct you to the right person. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. That's really helpful. I, I really appreciate that. And it's great information for everybody here on the webinar to, to hear. We'll try to, um, I do a post webinar sort of recap and I'll make sure to try to include that information, Renee, and I'll, I'll reach out to you to make sure I'm capturing it accurately. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Renee. That was great. The next question, I, I'm noticing we have about six minutes left. So I'm gonna try to get us through some of these last questions that we have here. One came in for Ariel from Haley which was, do you think mixing the compost into the top couple inches of soil would have changed the results rather than just placing it on top? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the reason that we didn't do that is because there's a lot of places where that's not feasible. Um, and especially in a landscape like mine, I would not want to run any sort of rototiller uh, in that in those soils. There's about like a 60% uh, rock content to those soils. Um, it would ruin any sort of agricultural equipment that is usually needed to incorporate that into the soil. Um, and I would, my heart goes out to anybody trying to like mix compost in with bubble, uh, in those landscapes. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it would have been different. Um, but I, I hope I never have to find out how. I think I just want to add, you know, one of the benefits of using rocker or mulch, just mulch on top of the soil surface is that if you're not penetrating the soil surface, often the permits that you have to secure if you're working on county land or, or fed land is different than if you are not penetrating the soil surface. So I don't know, Ariel, maybe that wasn't a concern because you were like, meh, this is going to break any machine anyway. But um, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people like using these kinds of things, because although permitting is very important for lots of different reasons, um, it can be extremely slow and extremely expensive and, and um, retard any attempt to actually um, move forward in projects. And so if you're not penetrating the soil surface, usually there's certain um, permits you don't need to secure. So it's just something to think about. Yeah, great. Thank you, Elise, for jumping in there. That was really helpful. Um, another question here from Andrew. Um, some kudos to Ariel. Excellent presentation. What was the average annual precipitation for the area you were studying? I'm curious about what level precip gets high enough that compost becomes beneficial. Yeah, thanks. I had to go back to the data and crunch the numbers in real time when I saw that question answered because they don't have it in the paper. Over the two years, um, we had 21 and a half inches of rainfall uh, in 2018, the time that we were there, there was 13.93 inches and in 2019, 7.66 inches. So we, we didn't get much rainfall. Um, uh, yeah, those are fairly average, I guess, you know, there's a lot of variability here in rainfall. I think that's the, the, the most common thing, but um, it's not exceptional. It's not a huge amount and it's not uh, very little. Um, uh, yeah, more rain would have been better. I'm not sure where that threshold is. I'd be really curious as well. Um, it'd be fun to do some some sort of like a precipitation gradient experiment somewhere where, where that works. It might be tricky to find without soil types changing a lot. Maybe maybe on Hawaii or something uh, is the place to do that kind of research, but that'd be really cool. Great. Uh, one of the last comments that I, I want to bring up here was from Matt, and it said chipped ash juniper mulch one to three inches has worked well in the Texas Hill country for germination and growth. Dr. Warnock had similar results using soil erosion socks filled with cotton gin debris as the Lunas. Lastly, I wonder if the standing mulch also protected plants from herbivory. Maybe I'll just open that up to either of you um, to comment on. Yeah, the, we we actually set up some uh, some trail cams at some of our some of our plots, which is really fun. Um, we didn't really incorporate any of that data into the publications. Uh, it wasn't very sciencey, uh, but we saw cows and they were eating grass, um, and and we also saw rabbits. They were also eating grass, um, and and we definitely saw that some of those uh, the grazing. You know, when I looked at where where it went down to, it wasn't all all the way down to the root. They were sort of stopping. Um, 
where that mesquite branch was. It's very spiny. I think if you added thicker mesquite branch mulch, you'd be able to do an even better job of that. It'd be, it'd be pretty cool. Um, but yes, I think that definitely happens. And you see some of that effect. There's some research about that um, sort of under, underneath mesquite trees where some of the branches are kind of like uh, ponderous and hanging over things. You know, cattle can't get in there as easily sometimes. Um, so yeah, that definitely did. I think there are other parts of that question, but I forget what they were. So I'll, I'll mute myself again. I just want to see you gesticulate more about trees and animals trying to eat them. Um, and there's sciencey things about there's people who base their entire careers on trail cams. Anyway, uh, so we definitely saw, we didn't collect data on it, but it was like fairly clear that the seedlings, when we collected data, everything was still super small. So the seedlings that were amongst the rocks were do, were like way bigger, bigger and sort of seemed in better um, health than any seedlings outside. We're gonna collect that data soon um, to actually assess that. So what we saw is that the rock, the, our rock mulch was definitely protecting the seedlings when they were still at about the height of the rock mulch was this like, I don't know, maybe 15 centimeters above the ground, something like that. Um, after it grows out, you know, things are probably gonna try to get in there and get the tips. But um, I think the seedlings are definitely protected during their most vulnerable stage for sure. Great. Well, I'm going to wrap us up here. We're right almost um, at the three o'clock hour. I did want to point people to a comment left by Kari, who says that um, there will be some wood chips for folks if they have project or research needs around the Tucson area. It looks like Tucson Audubon will have wood chips sourced from a salt cedar felling project. Um, and there is some contact information there, should that be of interest to anybody. And with that, uh, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Of course, thank you to Ariel and Elise for, for spending time with us and sharing some of your knowledge. This webinar was recorded and, and it will be available on the CCAST YouTube channel where you can find all of our other previous webinars. If you enjoyed hearing about this, I encourage you to visit CCAST and the case study dashboard. Uh, where we currently have over 173 case studies, um, some of which are on similar topics. We are working on lining up webinar speakers for the coming months. So definitely contact us if you would like to present or, or have speakers that you would like to hear from, uh, projects that you would like to learn more about. And if you'd like to receive webinar announcements uh, but are not yet on our mailing list, Thanks again for all your time. Thank you to our presenters and we hope you have a great rest of your day.